In February 2003, an unsigned rock band played the Astoria Theatre in London. It sold out. They were the darkness. Tonight, they return to the Astoria in front of a specially invited audience to relive the moment when the world's eyes were open to the darkness. That's awesome, isn't it? In the 10 months since that gig, Justin Hawkins, his brother Dan, and longtime friends Ed Graham and Frankie Poulain have sold over a million copies of their number one album, Permission to Land, uniting the public and dividing the critics. All the charts are filled with pop, and then they come along and they just show you what rock's made of. They're just wicked, absolutely wicked. Entertainers to the core. It's, it's a guitar solos again. I haven't heard guitar yeah, solos guitar in about solos. 10 years. Yeah. And, you know. Half the people think it's just all one big joke, taking, like, Mickey Take the 80s. The other half think, hang on, this is actually if this was released in the 80s, it would be world class. Fantastic. Lively music, it's just great. Yeah, I second that. It's really good. Yeah, it's good. Right, yeah. that, that camera in. I don't want to see the enemy here tonight. I don't want to see the face here tonight. Well, they, they put us on the front cover of the magazine and then slagged us off for four pages. I just found it very disappointing. Um, well, it all began when Justin and I were born um, from the same womb, but not in at the same time because we're not twins. I always thought I was going to be a doctor. And then um, Dan got into trucks and I got into sharks. So then I thought I'd be like Hooper from Jaws. And then, like, um, if my eyesight wasn't as bad as it is, then I would, I would be a helicopter pilot. So it was never actually a career path. It was just something I always did anyway, you know. And then um, just sort of drifted into it, I suppose. Because before that, I could have, could have done... You know, I would have turned my hand to anything to make a crust sort of thing. It's just this one is really... I found catharsis in it at last, you know. It's back. Glam Rock is back. I'm so happy. I like their uh, music and their uh, anarchic humour. It's just music that makes you want to get up and rock, and, and it's plain as simple as that. I believe in a thing called guitar! That's the line of the year, isn't it? I'm going to have to love you and leave you, cos I ain't going to miss... I'm not missing the start for anything. right at the start was let's just play on Fridays and Saturday nights because this band has always been about just having as much fun as we can and, and doing exactly what we want so there was no master plan we knew right from day one that we were going to be completely different and probably suffer for it but we didn't give a fuck because like, we're having too much fun because ultimately if you're doing something that you really love you can't go wrong who cares if you don't make any money from it? Who cares if people laugh at you? Who cares if you're not successful? Uh, we certainly didn't. We, we ne never got, got the green light in the first place to go ahead with what, we, what we've um, done. We've just done it ourselves and we just steamed in like that rock snow plow and just got on with it. It's not like you want to be really smug about it, but you can't help but chuckle a bit when there's certain people trying to take back the statements that they said, like, two years ago about us, like, oh, you know, never going to get anywhere, they're this, they're that. And especially when it's people, depressing things, the people who actually liked you, your music, so I really like them, great band, never going to sign them, never going to sell any records. I think there was someone who used to call us um, Bjorn again in, in the respect of can entertain people, fill out place, but will never sell a record. In the last quarter of this year, I was looking at Music Week. Who, who sold more, more records than us in the last quarter of this year? There is no, there is nobody. There's nobody who sold more records than us. You know. So I mean, you can tell, you can tell a person that something's cool to, to a council. If they don't like it, they ain't gonna buy it. When the backlash comes, that'll be what we have to stand by. Is look at people who actually bought it and actually know it's good and like it. And that's, we're not gonna give a fuck what the press say. It's the backlash is beginning, and everybody wants to come out and say, "I'm the one who shot Jr." You know what I mean? Yeah. And we're JR now. 
There are certain people who, who want to come on tour of us, do a few dates, do a little reportage, they're being all nice to us, eating our food, and everything's cool. The piece comes out and it's fucking piss take from beginning to end. And that's a man who's going to go down, you know, when we next see him, he's going down. And there's no doubt about it, there'll be a fuck off tablet administered and he'll be made to swallow it. When you make an enemy out of us, you make an enemy out of us for life. And that, that's the same quality as loyalty, you know, and it is rare and we're proud of it, you know. So basically, you fuck us over once and that's it. You ain't never, if you ever spotted in a show with us, you're going to be ejected and probably beaten up on the way up. <laughs> that's probably a bit much. <laughs> talking points of, of our gigs will be the people that were at the gig and what they were doing and how amazing that was and, and how there was like a, a mother with like her nine-year-old kid and both of them were going like that and, and you got everyone from taxi drivers to policemen you know professors to comedians so on and so forth it's like everyone being there because it's something special is happening it's like an event rather than a recital of songs Dan was one of East Anglia's uh, youngest soothsayers. He was able to predict the weight, gender, and uh, distinctive markings of cattle some five weeks before they were born. You know, word, word spread of his unique gift, and, and people thought that he was like um, a witch. You know. To which my parents replied, that's utter rubbish. <laughs> 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 What's the band? I was reading somewhere. Uh, but you had some tremendously good spoof album titles. No, that will suffice for me. Now, if you please, some sex with my friends was one of the titles that we. I think it ended up being one of the top three. Well, I wanted it to be persimmon to land, and rather than, you know, rather than a spaceship, just have a massive piece of fruit. 
I think thank you is a bit too much of a mouthful, really, wasn't it? The thank you, this will suffice for me now. I can please have sex with my friends. Don't think that bowls of tongue. You can imagine the queue in HMV never really diminishing. You know. And the whole point of that one was um, yeah, it would be abbreviated. So whenever you'd see it written down, it'd be thank you, dot, dot, dot. So but then thank you is not very rocking. Is it? Give me a day! Give me an Agnes! Give me a C! Give me an Arling Homecoming! Does anybody remember a single from a little while ago? A little number called Growing On Me! Stuff that I demand from the bands I listen to is, is, you know, people in tight trousers for a start. That's a stumbling block for most bands, I think. The tightness of the trouser. There's also like a um, willingness to display top half flesh. Culture permitting, apparently in Singapore you can't do that. country you really ought to be prepared to sweat work for your audience you know you can't really expect them to return the favor if you're standing there cool as your life with a snooker waistcoat on it isn't going to really inspire the same sort of energy from a crowd is it but it doesn't mean i would tend to stand there with a pint like that if i was watching a band that wasn't going for it and i'd be more inclined to join in if they were i think a band that goes for it wears tight trousers little or nothing on the top and that's it, yeah, that's what I would demand. How did the dining start? Um, it started with Dan and Justin being brothers, Ed being a school friend of theirs. I met Dan in London about seven years ago, played in various bands with him. We had a place in Shepherd's Bush, and uh, Justin used to come and visit at the weekends. In fact, Ed used to as well. Oh, that's just a real, kind of a lad's flat, wasn't it, really? Nice, man. It was an old flat, wasn't it? It was one of those old houses. It was quite spacious, wasn't it? You know, it was, it was just right. It had a good vibe, you know, living with uh, other musicians, in fact. Justin was living up north and used to come down and visit. And Ed used to come and visit as well. well. Just for me, it was like Dan and Frankie lived there and Justin would semi-move down there, was staying on the sofa, and then I came to visit. And, I, you know, I got out of the tube up there and... Um, it took me ages just to find it, but it was the first time I'd ever come to London on my own, you know, I was only 17. And when I got there, I was going, uh, excuse me, is this, this where Dan Hawking, is this where Dan lives? And this guy, Ben, was going, no, no, not here. And I said, no, I'm sure it is. Uh, is. Are you sure this is not where Dan lives? He was going, no, no, he's not here, he's not here. I said one final time, so you sure Dan doesn't live here? And he was like, 
Dan who, like this, and uh, he did live there after all, but, and they all let me in. That was the first time I, I went around that flat. It's funny the way things turn out, you know. It was basically just a full-on muso flat. Everyone who lived there was, a, was either a singer-songwriter or a guitarist or whatever. And, um, so there used to be jams and stuff, and I think there was Ed playing, yeah. playing drums there. And it was everything. the first time, actually, probably, that um, we've all played together. I don't think this scooter store was here. That's, that used to be one of the best, well, most poshest Indian restaurants that we knew of. I think the smell used to permeate up through the stairwell. It's quite quite pleasant, really. But it's like sleeping on a massive popper dom or a naan bread or something. It's really, really nice. But I, only, I never actually lived here. I, I was like, um, I used to come down at the weekends and hang out with the uh, guys. Frank used to look after me and buy me pints and that because I was a student in those days and I didn't have enough money to go to the pub all the time. This is, this is Dan and Frank's abode, really. Still got the same carpet. Can't believe they haven't put a new carpet. Only a couple of Frank's uh, doll checks. OK, well, the bathroom's not changed. Exactly the same. One of our, our flatmates was very, very vain. He just spent about three hours in the bath at a time, so didn't really see much of this. And then now that was uh, the smallest one, so I was the last one to uh, come in here. This little room here. Just one little single mattress on the floor there. I wasn't really into home comforts in those days, you know, it didn't seem uh, to be the priority at the time. And Dan had this room here. So grim. <laughs> it is strange to go back to your old, um, your old flats, isn't it? Everything looks so different. Oh, God, it seems so small. <laughs> it's oh, I used to have parties on the balcony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It might have been the scummiest flat in London, actually, at one point. There were like, hundreds of bin bags everywhere. No, nothing ever got washed unless every single item of cutlery was dirty, and then it had to, <laughs> then it had to go, you know. It was sort of... When Ben was in that room, going in that room was just, no, no, you end up with typhoid or Legionnaire's disease or something. No, really horrible. <laughs> Phil K came. That's right. Phil and it, we're, 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 we're ch me and him were trying to see who could be the most outrageous, and he ran down two houses down and got on their exercise bike to the horror of the family sitting there and I just pissed off the side of the balcony into That's the right. street. <laughs> but it's hard to tell who won on that one really. It was a tough it, one, wasn't it? It really was, it was. Yay! Oh, Cheers. Cool to see that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Cool. Nice people, aren't they? That episode of my life is now behind us. Let's move on. Hey! Now, February this year, not only did we play here as a headline artist for the first time and sold it out, which some people call a turning point. Remember, those, remember that Omar? He sold out the Brixton Academy, didn't he? And he was unsigned. It's not, not the same level as that, but it's a different type of music, and despite either being ridiculed or ignored, we managed to develop a huge following and sold out the Astoria, which is uh, quite an achievement, really, for an unsigned band. Yeah, it was really important. It was, um, it was a bit of a turning point. It was really, uh, you know, all the people that went there were all rooting for us, you know, it was all like, you know, fighting against the odds. It's like, you know, um, really supporting this kind of cult phenomenon. Everyone there was like, kind of like, like oh my God, are they going to pull it off? The atmosphere at the gig was amazing. It's kind of uh, hysteria, very intense. It was kind of nerve-wracking, but um, ultimately we, we knew we were going to kick ass that night. And, I mean, you can't not kick ass when you've got such a great reaction coming from, from your fans, really. The Astoria was like the, the point when um, the Daily Star came around and said, oh, this band just sold out the Astoria, who are they? You know, started featuring us and we became a tabloid entity. And it, that was the beginning of us crossing over into the mainstream. Also, we released a single on Must Destroy Records, which caused some stink. This one's called Get Your Filthy Fucking Hands Off My Woman, Motherfucker. <laughs>
thought that they'd bite our hands off anyway, so it's been like four years coming. Yeah, and then when they do start biting your hands, I think, well, that's about time, isn't it? Wow. We knew we had what it took, um, and it's just a matter of convincing everyone else that. So it's, our job was just to earn a following, I suppose. And that was, it was only ever a matter of time. You know, elbow grease, head down. Let the music do the... Uh, Banking. Just the people on the balcony, huh? Mother. Well, I don't know about you, that sounded weak as fucking piss to me. <laughs> Shh. Try again, that's not fair. Come on, give him a chance. Mother. Well, that's fucking outstanding. Let's take some beating, yeah? Wait! Optimum impact. If you shut up when I'm talking, then when you sing, it's gonna be fucking. It's gonna take your face off. Ready? Ready? Beautiful. Hey, everyone in the fucking house. What say ye? I've got, um, I haven't got 41 Thinlizzy t-shirts, I think I've currently got about six. Actually, I'm wearing the original. Look, mm. I wore this T-shirt for three and a half years worth of gigs, and then someone stubbed a fag out on the back of it and uh, put a big hole in it, so I had to kind of look elsewhere. So a friend of mine made up a load more, and it's just got totally out of hand now. I've got, <laughs> I've got um, uh, this woman in Japan who makes them. She gets like uh, diamantes and tropical fish skin. Some of them are made out of, and you know, all like built for you know, highly reflective stage wear. Why does the world need the dance? Yours well, is not to world. see why. Yours is to see a whale. Not to see a whale. <laughs> the world needs the darkness for many reasons. Most notably, because at the moment it wouldn't be able to live without us. It wouldn't be able to stand on its own eight, 16 billion feet. It just wouldn't have what it needed to dance the dance. Is anybody here partial to a power ballad? Mm. I love nothing more than raising a cigarette lighter in the sky, releasing the flame, and listening carefully to Love is only a feeling.
I mean, Bono once said, you know, I mean, anyone can write a song, but very few people can write great songs. Or, or I think it was even just good song, he said, and that's kind of true. of the kind of genre in which we're operating, classic rock, you know, there's so many ways to get it wrong. The rules are there to be broken and it should be a pleasant surprise when things don't turn out as they should. Not just in music, I mean, in life generally, I mean, surely that's a good thing, you know, when something is surprising and uh, seems there's always been a sense of the ridiculous about good rock music anyway. To tell you the honest, I find them um, guitar shops and the whole environment a bit weird. It's something weird about playing a guitar with someone looking at you, hoping that you're going to buy it, sort of thing. This thing's so strange. I don't practice as such. I still don't know any scales. I know one that Justin showed me. Ready? I'm, I, you know, don't practice just right. Got a, got the guitar version of this. This is the bass, clear. Perspex. Yeah, see right through it. Ooh. which is fairly sad. But what I noticed is that even if they're signing an ACDC album, they still write their name and then they put the name of their band underneath it, so as to avoid any confusion. Which I think is it's a good habit to get into, but they've only got four letters in their band name, and I've got to do that every time. So it's a bit of a pain in the ass, isn't it? Name this tune.
get really old when you feel a bit precious about it. And obviously, I like to incorporate a little bit of energy into my performance. And I'm just, I'd always be worried that I'm going to break something on it. No, because at that point, it stops being original when you have to replace stuff. It's better off buying new ones, if you ask me. So you're not just smashing that guitar, as my wife No, I think that's the equivalent of beating up your wife in a pub. You know, you, to, you should treat your instrument with respect. If you love your instrument, your instrument will love you. A, they're expensive. B, that somebody spent a long time making them when they're good. You know, real craftsmanship. It's like, it's, like crash, it's like crashing a sports car. You know, you get, you get a really flash car. A lot of people look at it and go, oh, I like one of those. You go, yeah, what's this then? Just drive it into a wall. It's offensive, it's vulgar, you know. Right. See you on the pattern. Yeah, too much smashing up guitars. You've never done one ever? I wouldn't go that far, but I mean, I never will again. Unless we do end up in that sort of mindset where you, you know, you really can't just tell your ass from your elbow. <laughs> At that point, we could probably talk. Next thing I want to look at is my amps, though, because uh, they're making some for me and they're going to have like a embossed. Yeah. Red leather in a floral print, just like my tattoo, on the sides, wicker fronts. And then at that point, then I just arrive, and then it'd be like, oh, we've got to tone everything down, guys. Oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> Getting recovered. We take the music very seriously. We take what we do very seriously. You know, we're very, very you know, self-critical. And um, what we don't do is take ourselves as people that seriously. You do a lot of work, you try to get as good as you can at what you do, and then you take it out there and you have as much fun as possible because otherwise, what's the point? 
<laughs> but I mean, pol politicians should take themselves seriously. You know, not rock, rock musicians. I, I want to make it clear that I haven't, I haven't had any cosmetic dental work done. Because I know a lot of people look at these and they think, well, that's cost them a few bob, isn't it? And um, I certainly do not wear a wig. Because you buy these in shops, they're quite a popular range of uh, thinning wigs. <laughs> and I'm not 80 or 40 or 30. At the moment, I'm 28. Those are the myths I'd like to dispel. Let's talk about success. <laughs> I was quite foresighted in the success change procedure. Because um, some time ago I stopped going to the pub anyway and lost touch with all my friends, bar one. And I think that was uh, the wise move, really, because when it started going like that, suddenly, abruptly, there comes a point when going to the pub becomes a slight leech attack. Ordering a pint of beer involves signing several autographs maybe a breast, maybe having a photograph taken with a couple of people, and then you get your pint and you think, oh, she's got a can of beer delivered, you know. But then if you stop going to the pub after that point, people think, oh, he's changed. People don't think that about me because I changed a long time ago. <laughs> And if he hadn't become famous, I could have just started getting the pub again. Everyone, everyone would have thought, hey, you're right. Got over whatever that terrible illness was that kept you away. You've done your uh, territorial army stint or whatever. It's just, no, it just didn't come to the pub. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
think the nation of rock has contributed the most to our success. I mean, because the inhabitants of this sweet nation that we call rock, that transcends normal geographical boundaries, have rallied together to say this is good, this is something valid and vital and important, and this is taking our favourite form of music into, into a place, a realm, if you like, that we feel that it belongs in, you know, so let's get behind it. There is a misconception. Well, actually, it's not a misconception. It's just the way things are. Everyone, everyone naturally assumes that, that you're doing everything you do for money. And, and like, it's quite easy for, for a band to write a Christmas song, but why would you, I suppose, is the question you ask. Um, we did it because, A, we love Christmas. B, there is a, a, a gap in, you know, what's going to be the next single needs to be released around Christmas time. Well, why don't we write a Christmas song? Merry Christmas, everyone. There is people sort of telling you, oh, maybe that's a step too far, you know, but, um, yeah, no one's done a good one for years. It's kind of presumptuous just to think, oh, because it's a Christmas song, automatically it's going to be kind of silly or bonkers. Exactly the same thing with, oh, the singer's wearing a cat suit, so it must be ridiculous. But also, the Christmas song, for example, it isn't kind of ridiculous. It's, it's quite a heartfelt song, you know? You'll probably be listening to it as part of this program, won't you? So I suppose there's no point in me saying anything more. Very sinister about the whole process of making money at Christmas time. Yeah, I don't know really, it's all about giving. But what we're giving with this record is the opportunity to buy our record. But hopefully at the same time, it's buy a record and thus earn enjoyment from it.
a gift exchange, you know, without actually physically being there to pull the cracker at each end, we are presenting one another with something quite special. <laughs> <laughs> How do you like that? Excellent, excellent, excellent. Fantastic, <laughs> mind blowing. Absolutely fantastic. I even got my tits out. Right at the front. Touch Justin on the leg. That rocked. I believe in a thing called love. I actually like Kylie, but after tonight, it was fantastic. Bedlam night, brilliant. I've had to change my t shirt because that's how good they are. Amazing, the darkness rock! Got that it. bloke who pissed me off to do with the face who wrote that thing. I just had a text for him. So I, I said he was on the list and I didn't put him on the list because I wanted him to come and languish outside because he wrote. He came on two of us three days. Remember that bloke? And he wrote, wrote right slagging off. So, uh, hey Justin, Charlie here. Came along to the story but got stuck at the guest list. Hope it went well anyway. See you in Brixton. <laughs> Eat that. <laughs>